And now it is time for historical fiction writing with Clive Rose. She is the author of the award-winning novel, Always a Princess. I've got my copy right here handy. And its sequel, The King's Mistress, as well as other short stories and forms of historical fiction, Regency romance, suspense. Clive, you've got so much going on and I'm excited to talk to you and see if we can get some writing tips and so an understanding of historical fiction. And let's start there because the accuracy that's involved, the research that's involved, because readers of anything historical, they have certain expectations, don't they? Do you want to talk about that? They do indeed. I, I find the readers broadly, this is very broad, fall into two categories. The, the one category who just want a general feel for the period and are really there for the romance and the escapism and they don't much worry about whether you get a term of address correct. And then there are other actual historical research buffs who really get into that. And it can pull them out of a story if that's wrong. That said, you can take some risks once you have a feel for your readership. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's true, too. And you do so much research when you're writing historical fiction. I, with fantasy, you have to be accurate. You might want to create some kind of a Bible so that you don't contradict yourself. But with historical fiction, you're looking up the past and going back in time so that you can really get a feel for everything. And I know you do that oh so well, and you've gone down the rabbit hole, so to speak, on some things. Can you talk about the research that you have done, your methods? Um, well, I love I love the research. That's one of my favorite parts. Sometimes I can get so caught up in it, I almost forget to, like, okay, you'd actually need to write now. Um, and there's lots of things that I check. I'm, I'm a, One of the things I do is I'm a member of quite a few groups. There's one called Trauma Fiction where I check things like, if you're shot with a bullet from the 1800s, what what might that be like? What kind of wound am I looking at? What kind of medical care is available? What what could go wrong? What could go right? And, and often I'll say, I need this to happen, but I don't want this person dead. This is how I want them to. If it's a hero or a, or a heroine, it's like they've got to survive. They ha do I want them maimed permanently? Do I not? If they've got a sex scene three or four chapters later, they've got to be reasonably able to handle that. How does that work? <laughs> Um, and, you know, things like did pe people made their bullets at home, so what am I looking at? What kind of medals? What would they use? What was handy? And then I'll get the fantastic, a lot of the reenactors come on, on to that sort of thing and they go, well, when I did reenactment last year, we melted down this bit of lead and that bit of iron and whatever, and they're great. They're terrific because they, um, I, I've got friends who do a lot of that stuff and I, I reach out to them and I say, how did that work? Um, I did um, the Christmas Salon, which was set in mostly mostly in France, and I, I reached out to my French friends because I've only been there briefly when I was younger. I'm like, okay, so I'm in Paris. It's it's 1814. I'm standing on this street. What am I looking at? Where am I? If I, you know, and then I had to work out um, how far it might be from Vienna to Paris by horse or by coach and what you can reasonably expect a horse to do. There's actually a, a website where you can work that out. Now, you can Google, I'm traveling this distance on horseback. What they don't take into account are things like the roads <laughs> and what time of year. Um, you're doing it in December, you're gonna have snow, you're gonna have impassable areas, places you can't safely take a horse or even go on foot. That kind of thing you have to work in your rider's brain on. But um, distances, a horse, for example, I'm like, if I'm traveling this distance and the horse is going this fast, how many, how many hours can I keep this up on an animal reasonably? And then the horse people will come onto Twitter or wherever and go, well, you cannot possibly ride that far for that long on a horse without killing it unless your hero or your, your character is an absolute animal cruelty person. I'm like, okay, well, you don't want any of your good people to do that. So you have to work all that out. Yeah. Um, so, that, so that's important. And then there's a lot of geography because in the Regency period, there were a lot of wars, borders were changed, countries were created and removed. Um, entire kingdoms were begun and ended um, across that period. So, um, I mean, France was trying to build an empire. The rest of Europe were resisting that. Um, countries like, um, uh, there were some countries that didn't really exist until afterwards, until after the Congress of Vienna, when they'd sat down and redrawn the map of Europe. 
So you have to know where that is and where that placement is. Right before Always a Princess went to print, I realised I'd spoken about the, the Duke of Wellington. Mm -hmm. And at the time I'd mentioned him in the book, one of the, one of the characters was talking about fighting in his, in his regiment. He wasn't a Duke. And I only realised that right before it went to press and I quickly got hold of the publisher and I said, can you change Duke to Marquess? He wasn't a Duke until, because the book is set in April and he wasn't a Duke till August. And they were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they fixed it. But I didn't real. I like literally by a few months, they could have got that wrong. And someone, I mean, he's a pretty important person in history. It's not the kind of thing you get wrong. Right, right. Some, somebody would have called you out on that, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I've been called out a couple of times on modes of address where I've stretched credulity. There's a character in my um, Regency Spy series who has the nominal title of a lord, but he is in fact not, um, he doesn't have any lands, he doesn't have an estate. He's called a lord because it helps him in his work for ah. the king. And um, they gave him the title so he has entree to all the right clubs and things where he picks up information and reports back. That's his job. But he is, in fact, um, not a, le a legitimate heir to anything. And a few people have put, pulled me up on that. And I'm like, yes, well. And so in the book, he makes that point. My, title, suit, my title suits Westminster, and that's why I have it. And also his brother's the prime minister, which helps. Right, right. It, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you go in and kind of explain so that people that might be calling you out, it's like, wait, I intended that. Or maybe if I didn't really intend it, I can explain it so that it, it kind of settles them mm. down. Can you talk about uh, you know that Regency period in time? It's a fairly short period of time, but there's something about it that really captures our imaginations, especially romance readers. Mm. Why do you think well, they love it so much? I think a lot of that's due to Austen, Jane Austen's books, which are so well known. I mean, they have been around since for over 200 years. She was a pretty in, incisive observer of human nature, and I do think human nature hasn't changed a great deal. Um, also, her books don't have copyright on them, so people can remake them, rehash them, rework them whenever, every which way, and they do. I mean, they just mm -hmm. released a new adaptation of Persuasion on Netflix this, like, in the last couple of months, I think. And then there were all, there's like three versions of Emma. There's heaven knows how many of Pride and Prejudice itself. Um, and then there are the update versions like Bridget Jones's diary, which I adored. I adored those. And um, Clueless, which is obviously a modern day remake of Emma. Um, although I do find the whole Knightley as the stepbrother thing kind of interesting. But yeah. Um, and I think that has fixed that era in people's minds is also the the time when romance a romantic kind of love was more sought after than it had ever been before because prior to that coupling off for any reason was more a matter of economics convenience and rational consideration than it was about love mm -hmm. as though love was a minimized thing and not very important um not just for noble families which were the, they were the celebrities of their day. The way people follow the Kardashians now is how people would follow the Dukes and Duchesses back then through the scandal sheets, um, which I suppose was the forerunner of TMZ and whatnot. Um, sure, sure. So I don't think things have changed very much. They've just been more updated and they come at you a lot faster. And um, I think that's one of the reasons people like it so much. And I mean, who who isn't in love with the beautiful gowns and the beautiful balls and the the way the way people related in those days was, in in some ways, um, gentler. Although it's hard to tell because, of course, we're seeing it through the way it's been presented to us, which has been very romanticized. It's yeah. Hard, I mean, a lot of people say, "Would you have liked to live back then?" I'm like, "Yeah. Well, my, with my luck, I'd probably end up a chambermaid." So no. Um, <laughs> Would I like to be like a Lizzie Bennett? Sure. But would I like to be the maid cleaning up after her? Not really. Right, right. Well, that's the thing. Pe and people... someone had to do those jobs. Exactly, exactly. So we do romanticize eras from the past like that. We think of, oh, the beautiful dresses and it was so lovely. Mm -hmm. But there was stuff going around like cholera and life expectancy was a lot shorter. Life was hard and difficult, but that's mm -hmm. the wonderful thing about yeah. being able to write about it because you get to put your creative spin on, on everything. Now, do you have any tips or suggestions to people who want to write historical romance or even just historical fiction in general? 
Um, I do. I do think research is important. There's a lot of things you have to know that the reader doesn't need to know. Um, I work with a writing mentor who's always coming to me and saying, they need to be confident that you know this, but they don't need to know it. And honestly, if the reader feels that they're in the hands of a confident storyteller, they will trust you far into the narrative and then you can take more risks. But if you're not confident about your own story and your own research and you feel the need to keep proving it to the reader, you will bore them. You will slow down the pace of your story and it won't work. Um, I, I do a lot more research than I show in my books because the re because I need to feel confident that I know this this world. Um, one of my characters is a perfumier. I know how to make per perfume in the 1800s, but they don't need to see her do that if it's not relevant to the story. They just need to believe that she knows how. And for that, I need to know how. But they don't need to, I don't need to tell the reader if it's not going to move the story forward. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you so, find yeah. yourself doing research and you've got all of this knowledge and you want to put it in there so bad and then it's like you're killing your darlings because you are forced to take it out because it's just, it's not needed. It's too much. Do you, do I do, you I do a lot of that. And that's when I, I, I about, I, do, I write, a, I write a blog and every now and again, I'll do a little historical blurb about, I did one recently about um, highwaymen because I'd been researching that um, for, for Stand and Deliver, the novella. And um, there was a lot more information obviously that went into the story because the romance is the foreground and the highwaymen and everything is the backstory. So I make a blog post with information I learned that I think is interesting. And some of my, some of my readers like it, some of them don't, but. There you go. That That's a least, great. At least that put that pin in that information. So. Yeah. Oh, that's great advice. And that's great for, for writers in general, you know, put a lot of that research and that extra stuff that you do into the blog and you can use that in your marketing and promotions. I exactly. love that. I love that. Clive Rose. Okay. Your book is always a princess. And then we have book two, which is the King's mistress. And like you said, you're in lots of different anthologies and the Christmas salon and, and all of that stuff. We'll put it in the comments. There, there it is. I love it. We'll put it in my the mother's comments. favorite one. It's always here. She, out of all the things I've written, that's the one she loves. That, that's her favorite. Oh, there's nothing like making mom happy, right? Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Absolutely. We'll put all your details in the comments. And plus, you have a page here on the BookFest website. Clive Rose, the amazing award-winning author of Always a Princess, The King's Mistress, and so much more. Thank you so much for being with us on the BookFest. My absolute pleasure. You bet. You bet. And more is coming up next on the BookFest Adventure Fall 2022.